this is our agenda. Our first part is some general statements about flow games and gamification. And the second part is how we can assess change potential in an individual or in an organization by letting the person or group of persons play games. And then specifically how agility level, or agility potential can be measured by this game that we're going to introduce on a personal and on a team level. Okay. Okay. Now, it's interesting uh, to note that the first industry that was based on the concept of flow is the gaming industry. Because in order for a game to be successful, it needs to have the same qualities as what flow usually helps to establish. So I have a question now to Mike. Uh, what do you, you show the question? Yes. This is the question to you, Mike. What do you think about flow being so useful in gaming, the gaming industry, about which uh, you had some mixed feelings uh, long ago? And I'm thinking about when Zed, who is the creator, one of the co-creators of this game we're going to talk about, is back there doing the uh, slides, visited you and proposed that maybe based on your book, he wants to work with you to create a game. Your first response was not that friendly toward games. <laughs> yeah, because my, my impression of... Uh, video games was that uh, they uh, were based on rather uh, unsavory uh, foundations of fighting and uh, 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 shooting down, uh, well, the shooters, they were called the shooter, shooter games. And uh, also that you what the games were based was a quickness of response rather than any particular skill and um, or the only skill that you you built up was to shoot quickly when you saw a monster appear on the screen um, so uh, that wasn't um, didn't sound like a very interesting uh, procedure, but I saw the earlier uh, video games that were produced by the company, uh, Alias, that uh, produced, ended up producing Flow. And the earlier games were really very exciting uh, without anybody getting killed or without <laughs> anyone killing or anything, but uh, they dealt with real interesting intellectual, emotional issues. And uh, I said, oh, so maybe it's possible to make video games that so, will. So maybe a, you know, a little bit of explanation of this, that when Zed uh, read his book, uh, The Good Business Book, Good Business, uh, Flow Leadership and Making of Meaning, he was so excited, he said, I'm going to make my next game out of this one. His company is making games. And so, some difficulty, he agreed, Mr. Mike agreed to, to see him in California. And when he told him, I said, well, games is but my grandchildren playing, you know, and he's shooting and so on. I'm not that interested. Because he had no, no experience before uh, with other kind of games. And then Zed showed him his EU, European Union award-winning game about the game was to uh, choose, you are somebody who has to choose a team to climb the Himalayas, the top mountain of the Himalayas. And you had to choose among the many applicants. And so Mike, in his younger years, was a mountain climber. And he was captivated, am I correct, by this yeah, game? Absolutely. And he said, let's give it a try, and the rest of it is history. Okay, good. 
Uh, <clears throat> now, MIT research on gaming has shows that children and adults devote so much time to game play because it yields freedom to experiment, next, freedom to interpret, freedom to fail in a safe environment, freedom to calibrate the effort you want to put into a game, and a freedom to fashion one's identity. As your answer to the last question at the end of your talk, Mike, you mentioned that most people want to identify, have a good identification about self, and work often provides, and uh, work in getting into flow often provides that help identification. So, this is an MIT research about gaming generally, and then agile leadership, the focus of this conference, requires the very same environment as what MIT research identified as why it's so far, games are so popular. Thank you. Okay, now, Mike already referred to Fligby. Fligby stands for flow is good business for you. Flow is good business for you, Fligby. Uh, okay, and this is Cheek Said Me High's scientifically designed official leadership simulation game. It is also a people analytics tool. Okay, and uh, Zed and I and a colleague uh, a year ago published a book. And Mike was so kind and write uh, the first chapter in that book. And this is a quote from Professor Cheek Said Me High. He says, the Fligby game has created a bridge between my scientific work and aspiring and practicing managers and leaders who are interested in my ideas but are not sure how to apply them in everyday practice. Okay? Uh, now, question to you again, Mike. Uh, how is Fligby a useful research tool for you or for other scholars? Uh, so you don't mean for the player, but for that those who for analyze. You. That's that. right, that's right. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I wasn't sure at first whether that would yield interesting results, but by now that there are thousands of players around the world, it's really very intriguing to see how um, different countries, different cultures, different industries, uh, the people involved in them, how differently they think, what kind of decisions they make, uh, how, what kind of um, goals they want to maximize or prioritize, etc. So uh, it became clear that actually uh, looking at how people play the game will tell you something about the culture and the uh, priorities of the, uh, those who, who play the game. And in fact, um, I think it was, uh, I think it was Plato who said the Greek philosopher 2,600 years ago said that um, I learn more by watching a person play than spending hours of talking with that person. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, so it, it's true that a game environment, because it expresses, allows you to express yourself without worrying about consequences too much, then you can see what kind of things a person expresses. What, what are the things that they, how they operate in a complex decision-making environment and so forth. So it can be a good. And one, one example is that you showed in your slides, in your, in your keynotes speech, speech, where you showed that uh, 
the results of a substantial number of managers in a financial institution mm. showed that they have different type of skills, but they are stronger in certain kind of skills than say an automobile manufacturer. So yeah. this is one way in which it can be used. Okay. There are many other ways too. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now let's look at uh, a little bit more how this game works. Okay. Uh, Mike already mentioned that this game called Fligby is uh, at the end of quite a few hours of play, which of course can be done over several weeks or maybe a month and so, will enable the architects of the game to establish in which particular leadership skills, those 29 that Mike showed uh, uh, on the previous uh, chart, which of those skills uh, is an individual, a group of individuals particularly strong or particularly weak or weak. And this is an extremely useful information for the individual and also for, uh, for uh, the organization. So, <clears throat> how to measure leadership skills in a game play? Well, first, know precisely what you want to be measured. And what we want to measure in this game are those 29 leadership skills that you have seen on a previous slide. And I don't know whether you can show it again uh, here. Uh, the 29 leadership skill set, 25 of which are very similar that most scholars and business practitioners have identified as really important leadership skills. And then based on Mike's work and his interviews and so on, he added four skills that are especially important in generating flow in others, which of course is a key, was his key message. Okay, then in order for make people play a game that takes uh, quite a few hours, you need to create an engaging story that players can identify with. And at Mike's suggestion, the venue for this story, for this game, is a California winery. And so my question, Mike, is why did you suggest that a winery in California should be the venue this game, venue for this, this game? Yeah, well, they were I think some of our reasons, one is that I, uh, like most people, uh, understand how to make wines better than understand how to make the complex machinery that we use in automobiles or televisions or so forth. So we can, we can reasonably simulate the situation uh, where it's uh, that uh, most people could feel, yeah, I could do that. It's, it's something I could understand. So it's, it's uh, uh, at the same time, uh, I also uh, thought that I like wine, so I, it would be a good thing to, to see how people actually identify with that process. And of course, um, there was the added thing that the wine industry in California was started by a compatriot of ours, a Hungarian man who brought the cuts from Hungarian grapes and started the first winery in Northern California. So there were all kinds of reasons, mm -hmm. uh, uh, accessible, uh, friendly, and, and also historically kind of interesting. I Very good. So. And, and you, you know, it's part of the game has to be to design generalizable management dilemmas. And so the game, that the basic story is that an individual player, this game is played individually. At the end, the discussion and so on is done in a group but the game is played individually and the idea is that you, the player, is 
your first day appointed as the general manager of a California winery. And you have to work with eight colleagues in charge of different aspects of the winery. And although the winery is profits-wise is okay, the morale is really bad because the previous general manager messed up things really, really in a major way. So one of the uh, objectives is uh, reestablish morale, try to get more people flow or closer into flow, uh, pay attention to the environment, and of course, don't forget about profitability. So you have multiple objectives, typically like managers or leaders have multiple objectives. So the decision options uh, were defined around the general management dilemmas. Uh, 150 uh, decisions you have to make during the game, not all of which are the basis for measuring your skills, only about half of them. But in each dilemma, the player has four to five options to choose from. And it's based on those choices that both the results, these multiple objectives, will be achieved better or, or worse, uh, and also uh, the skills of the player will be tested based on what the decisions reveal. Of course, and then you have to establish the rules of scoring. How do you score? And in this particular game, uh, on 80 or so of those decisions on which core scoring, skill scoring is, is based, uh, either you get, depending on some answers you choose, chose, you got no points, or one or two or three plus or minus points, depending on the difficulty and, co and various other consideration. So that's how your, your skill score is established. And uh, academics and business practitioners then must interpret the results. So how did we do it? Well, uh, the architects of the game created a team made up of a psychologist and business practitioners. The psychologists, because they would know that given the carefully designed personalities of the characters, uh, how are they likely to react in terms of the uh, mood map that Mike showed uh, to the decisions that you are making? And you will be able to say this after each decision. You will see what you have done to the characters. And then as uh, the last point is to fine tune and validate the algorithms, both that measure the skills and also measure the results in achieving uh, those, those objectives. So we have benchmarking, for example, these skills have been benchmarked uh, against, uh, against uh, Strength Finder, Gallup Strength Finder. But the key point about this game, I couldn't emphasize strongly enough, is that the skill measures by Fligby, while they may not be fully accurate, because of course it's based only on the game, not the whole person, but certainly the results are going to be objective and unbiased. Because you see, most skill tests are based on questionnaires that some we have to fill out. And most people are smart enough to know if I answer this question this way, it will show me that I'm this kind of a person. But in this, you make 150 decisions. You have no idea how, what kind of skills will be re you're revealing. So one beauty of this, uh, this, this game is that it gives an unbiased objective measure of, of, of the person's skills within the limits of the game because it cannot be gamed. Okay, uh, I'd like you to repeat such an important point, Mike. Uh, those four green skills that uh, you, in, in your book, uh, with, uh, Good Business, you have described all of these skills based on interviews, your literature review, and so on. But four skills you especially stressed as being particularly important uh, in helping to generate flow in others. And so these four skills, again. 
Yeah, well, um, this, uh, many of these skills, I had heard about it and I knew, obviously, but I didn't know, I hadn't studied very much, as uh, Paul points out. Those four are things that I really studied uh, myself. Uh, the others uh, I knew for the importance by interviewing other, uh, uh, Scott, uh, the uh, business ex executives that I studied, but um, I think I think uh, they spent uh, pro uh, designing these games. They spent a lot of time to make the questions so uh, uh, cleverly disguised that I couldn't tell really what it was measuring or how it was measuring, but. Um, it's true that it's very difficult to just game the results, as, as you point out. I mean, it's uh, because every decision can have different. You could say, yeah, if you do this, we gain this and lose that, and so it's uh, always a question of uh, uh, having perhaps a a longer term vision that uh, you are concerned about the long term success of your strategy or your, your policy. That's one thing. The other one is uh, given the, the situation in this particular company, this binary, what is the most important type of skill or the important approach that you need to, to decide. And um, I think we went through uh, many months of looking at how credible these things are and how well they work. And many of the things were changed and many were uh, rewritten or, or eliminated and new ones added. And, and I think this, you know, I feel very comfortable that these are uh, now a very good uh, indication of the skill set that a person brings to the job. And, yeah, good, yeah. and by adding it up across the organization, you can see which are well covered and which, which aren't. And that's so right. that's a, Incidentally, uh, you know, the designers of the game were very careful to stress and to establish those kinds of dilemmas that typically are found in just about any corporation, not the technical ones, but the human relationship ones. So one of the great benefits of the game, after there's a general debriefing by a group of people from the same organization, say, well, how did you, what did you think about this particular dilemma? How do you decide? And then, and what are the parallels that you can think of? Have you faced similar decisions, similar characters? How you deal with them and so on? So a lot of problems that normally would remain hidden would emerge in the post-game discussion among the group of people who know the organization and of course also play the game. Okay, okay. I'd like to mention a few uh, further features of this game. The virtual characters uh, eight are pretty, pretty much those that most of us would have met in real life. And so, Zed, I'm going to ask you to uh, play a very short from the second uh, scene in which your team members briefly introduce themselves to you, the new general manager. And here is one character, and I'm going to ask you, the audience, and Mike, what do you think about this character based on her short introduction of self? Well, voice, voice, board. Anyway, to give a little, again, the background. Uh, so you're the new GM. First day, you're team is meeting you and uh, you can click on 
any one or all of them, hopefully all of them, uh, to let them introduce themselves. And each was given a very definite character uh, that you have to manage as the new manager. So, unfortunately, yeah. Could you on top? Okay. No. Okay. Well, maybe it has to go down. Maybe on the. My okay. I find them stilted, awkward, and false. Introductions have never really captured my imagination. I find them stilted, awkward, and false. I don't even know what I'm doing here. James should have taken me along with him to Top Dog Winery. Anyway, it would be better for us to sit down and have a proper meeting. I look forward to discussing my sales strategy with you. Will this afternoon be good? What do you... Uh what, do you, what is your, anybody has an impression, if you have heard, I don't know if you have heard, of this character, Rebecca, the sales manager. She's not happy, right? Not at all happy. And she is, my wife always told me, don't use the word aggressive, say assertive. So I think she's a pretty assertive character. Mike, you have any, uh, you helped to choose the actress to play this, uh, this role. Yeah, Tell think, about that. Well, I think she, she uh, has a persona that fits a uh, stereotype, which is unfortunately very often uh, present in many organizations. So a person who is kind of um, let no stone left unturned or uh, that's not very effective uh, at least ideally effective but she makes everybody else feel uncomfortable or, or uh, uh, she's not trusted by others very much uh, because she, they think that she's all trying to achieve her purpose regardless of who gets hurt and, and whatever. So I think I think she was very uh, good at representing what she was asked to do. Okay. And, and but here there is an interesting lesson. Most people who play the game say, if I were the general manager, I would fire her uh, the second or the third day, you see? Hmm. But then comes a situation in which she makes a really outstanding point, a very good strategic or tactical business point. And so it's very important, just because you don't like her, dislike her, not to look at her advice on the, through emotions, but consider whether objectively does this advice make sense. So it's very much like real life. Okay? Uh, played individually, debriefed in teams. Uh, two fantastic reports are generated right at the end of the, uh, the game. Each individual received a report, a detailed report in which the skills are established, uh, uh, compared, benchmarked, and so on. And also then, if a company would require, or uh, the person who is organizing that particular team, of players would also get a report about the group. And if you had time, I'd love to give you some illustrations of what, how can these group reports be used by the organization that's sponsoring its managers to play the game. Okay, <clears throat> so in order to get that report and to be able to measure uh, the skills, one must finish uh, the game all 23 scenes, and it takes six to eight hours on average That's uh, to do that. Uh, during playing the game, because it's so interesting, many people have been experiencing flow in the process. But it does require this time investment. And Flickby, the game mirrors the real world in several ways. For example, it is not completely PC. You know, PC for those who not Americans, perhaps uh, politically correct. 
for example, uh, it all happened to be all white characters. It doesn't have any uh, other 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 other, other uh, type of character. Is the game fair? Well, mostly yes, but maybe there are instances when it is not completely fair. And uh, so this game is neither PC, perfectly PC, not completely fair. Okay, and this is the reason behind it. And uh, are you in a real situation when you are managing people? Are they trying to manipulate you? Is your boss always supportive? Are your decisions uh, influenced only by the facts and not by emotions? And can you even your mentor be occasionally wrong with the advice that he or she gives? And so these are all features incorporated into the game. Uh, okay. Okay, now come to the, uh, the last part. <clears throat> How is it possible through this, is it possible through this game to measure sort of agility, which is such an important and such a complex uh, leadership trait and practice? Okay. <clears throat> uh, from a... Uh, Agile leaders are creative thinkers with a deep sense of purpose. They show a propensity and ability to move into actions and make decisions. Their implementation often results in greater learning. Agile leaders actively engage, drive, and dri drive stakeholders, influencing diverse stakeholders, influencing and studying them simultaneously. Uh, now let's see, so I think the last slide, or like last slide, how is this uh, done in this game? Okay, first, uh, the 29 leadership skills are identified in the game so that they can be grouped into different categories. Next. Uh, for example, to val validate Fligby's skill algorithm, they were combined into Gallup Strength Finder categories and they were well matched. Now, if we want to, Fligby skill set can be classified into agility components. And so, according to uh, our search of the literature, agility really uh, involves, broadly speaking, uh, anticipation outperforming through challenges and learning. So these three things, here are the Fligby skills that match each of, of, of those components of Agile leadership. Okay. Uh, again, this is a quote from, uh, from uh, one of Mike's books. An idea or product that deserves the label creative arises from the synergy of many sources and not only from the mind of a single person. One of the most impressive books I have read and I'm reading it second time now is uh, Creativity, Innovation, Mike's famous, one of Mike's famous books. So here's the question to you, Mike. You published a bestseller on creativity. Do you see any link between agile managers, leaders, and creative personalities? Yeah, well, um, I, when I wrote that book, I mostly interviewed scientists, artists, politicians, but I certainly was curious also of getting to talk to leaders of uh, different uh, business enterprises. And uh, you find uh, very, very similar uh, approaches from creative people in these different fields. And um, the important thing to realize is that creativity is, uh, requires an open and curious mind. Curiosity is probably the most important. Uh, and, um, but that doesn't lead to creativity by itself unless the person with the open mind has it filled with a lot of experience and knowledge about what they're doing uh, so that they can choose from the content of their ex own experience in their mind 
what is the appropriate thing to do in this circumstance and uh, how to do it. Uh, so you have to internalize a lot of knowledge and you have to have the resources. I mean, the fact that there, there have been no great scientists among uh, the Inuits or the Eskimos or, um, is not because there weren't probably potentially great thinkers there, but the uh, access to knowledge, the access, access to tools, the access to capital or, or anything uh, is needed to, to provide a creative solution. So that's why I'm saying the many sources, the sources are intellectual or, or uh, they are uh, the cultural, they are financial uh, sources and then you have to have the internalized, the curiosity to explore in your own area of interest, what can you do better? What, what option, opportunities there are? What, where there are things that could be improved on? And uh, even especially, how can you improve your own approach to the business or to the... Uh, so, um, absolutely, it's... Uh, there is a great overlap between these concepts. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so Mike asked to uh, put the last slide uh, to express his thanks to the organizers uh, for the insight of linking lean combine and agility and Mike's uh, famous flow research. This is really uh, his special ask to, to, to express these thanks. And we also uh, thanking uh, for everybody for interested in this session and the previous session, and hoping that you will find some useful ideas to introduce in uh, the workplace. And our last uh, sort of comment uh, is that since my colleagues and I, and this is Mike is talking, are passionate about promoting flow in business, we are offering complimentary access to the Fleeby game to all interested participants. So we will distribute a uh, little bit more information about the game, uh, about the whole flow concept, about leadership concept, and the gamification of that concept. And in the last insert, you will find a voucher, which you are welcome to use or to transfer or to give to anyone in your organization who might be interested to get free access to, to this game. Okay, and I hope we have some time for questions in case about... Uh, I do want to say one more thing because uh, somebody asked Mike a wonderful question at the end of his session. And one of the questions was, what are the obstacles to flow? Remember? Remember? And I was... I was thinking that Mike wrote so much about one of the obstacles to flow, and he did not mention that. And that is, he basically said, you know, his whole research as a youngster started out with his interest in, first of all, he is the co-founder of positive psychology, which is dealing with ordinary people, ordinary average persons, and not with mental illnesses. This is a new field, and he was interested in what makes people happy. And he identified there are basically two sources of happiness, or what people think are two sources. One is the external, more money, more power, better meals, more sex, more fame, and, and so on. But these are all depend upon you getting it externally. And once you get it, uh, first of all, the marginal returns from each additional unit will be very small. And more, le and more uh, he has a wonderful chart in his book showed that 50 years ago, the Americans were asked what percentage of the people are considering themselves happy. One third, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Today you ask, again, about one third of the Americans think that they are happy. So in other words, with increase in per capita income and living standards and all the new inventions, it doesn't make people happier. 
And the other source of happiness is that comes internally. When you find something as a hobby, as a work, in sports, whatever, that you really can periodically get into flow and so on. That is an inexhaustible source of happiness. It doesn't depend on the external environment, but it depends on your ability to do those things that you know, will help uh, to get into flow. And unfortunately, Mike is making so much on his, book, his books about this. Most people searching for happiness from the external sources and not from what is more readily available to them, which is to more often try to get into flow. Once they have reached it, a certain minimum standard of living, which of course is very important. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Please, uh, any questions, comments? Please uh, love your comments. Love your questions. Uh,